<laughs> Tell me, because I totally ig- ignoramus on 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 the cinema. I've always been interested in the uh, the relative prominence and honour that goes to directors and writers. Uh, Alan Silito is perhaps an exception because he is a pretty celebrated writer, but generally speaking, it is the director um, whom we know about. And there are some wonderful writers in film, and there are some wonderful lines and some wonderful scripts. And I, I don't think we've ever had a, a script writer chosen as as a, a, a great life. Is is that fair, Stephen? No, I, I'm you're the wrong person to ask. I think it's extremely unfair. Mm. And uh, I've spent my life working with or trying to work with very, very good writers, and I'm absolutely conscious of what I owe them. Yes, but in the end of the, at the end of the day, Stephen, it's a it's a director's medium. You know. Well, I don't recognise what you're uh, saying. Well, oh. here's right. <laughs> Very politics. You lie like a rug. <laughs> here's here's Rice lie himself. Lie like a rug. I'll put that in. <laughs> here's Rice himself, not lying like a rug on the <laughs> subject. There is a terrible tendency to leave out the writer. Now, of course, Alan's Saturday Night and Sunday Morning is as much Alan's film as it is mine. Alan Silito. Alan Silito's film, which is not to say that my view of the central characters is exactly the same as the writers. There is in both cases a sort of tension and collision between what they were essentially saying and what I wanted to say, which I think is very helpful. I think the that whole notion that a writer writes a script and then the director illustrates the intentions or fills in the colours as as closely as he can, is quite wrong. My view of the character didn't quite coincide with the authors, and it's it's the tension between those views which give the films whatever quality they have. That's a very astute observation about how he worked. His office was right next to the kitchen, and he would often, we would all often be sitting around, I remember once Pinter was sitting around when my son, then six, said to my late wife, is he a policeman? Because <laughs> and and uh, and 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 my my then wife said, "No, he's a very good writer." And Chris said, "Can he do a W?" And 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 Car- Carol worked and worked on um, in a really intimate way with the writers. But sometimes, and this is what I wanted to say, where he came a cropper, and really finally, it ended his career. Was he? We, there was much discussion about whether Arthur Miller should write the screenplay of Everybody Wins, and I argued no, because I felt he was a stage writer. Carroll had much more of a European sense of his greatness, and he was great. And what happened was he got into a situation in the middle of the film where he needed a rewrite, and uh, Miller could not do it. He was a theater writer. He wrote scenes. He couldn't write for the cinema. And when the film came out, and it was a complicated film and and an interesting one, but not successful, Miller told the Times that it was the fault of the director and sort of disowned the process that Carol was so brilliant at working with writers. And Carol's heart was broken. He was betrayed by Miller. And he went into his office. I, I'm serious. Uh, I, I think he stayed in his office more or less entirely for a year. And when he emerged, he decided that he just didn't want to do films anymore. He would work with actors. He would like the process. He would do Pinter's plays, and brilliantly, I have to say. But he did not want to do films anymore. He just it was it, The hurt was just too great. I, I've never seen him as depressed. You... John uh, wrote the book about Joe Orton, Prick Up Your Ears, and you, Stephen, made the film Prick Up Your Ears. Was that a happy collaboration? Was for me. Yes, I, th- I think so. It was, it, we, we did it, tried to do it twice. <clears throat> Alan Bennett wrote the script, and um, we failed to make it the first time, and then Alan went away and rewrote it. And... Um, Three years later, well, then my beautiful laundry got a decade, made. Just about. So, uh, it was after, uh, as a result of my beautiful laundry, we got mm. prick up your ears, mate. It was happy in the sense that we, mm. I signed my copyright over to Alan and Stephen, and so we all three owned it, mm. and so that means that they couldn't fire anybody. We really, and I think that, thanks to the good work of, of Stephen and uh, Alan and 
we got a, a, a really good film, I have to say, a, a, an adult movie, which is all you could ask for. And uh, it, was, it was good. Do you see a common theme uh, threading together Rice's work? Do you think he was no, consciously... I don't really... Um, I, don't really do, I don't really see a common theme, except mm. a, a kind of... There was a theme of... Well, there was a, a, a dark. theme of, of quality... But uh, Carroll right. didn't see himself as an auteur in the sense that he didn't think, oh, I have to do this because this is my, what I do. Or He didn't, in that sense, take himself seriously in that way. He took himself seriously in other ways. There you know, a- he, would have, he would have been proud to have just been a professional film director mm-hmm. and somebody very good at his job, which he was. Uh, Carroll did a really uh, interesting film called The Gambler, written by James Toback, who is uh, now a director and a uh, and a, and a sort of card carrying wild man, uh, you know. Still to this day, uh, he was the gambler of the title, and I I I think Carol would say, were he here, that one of the th- he was a very he was a homebody. Carol, he didn't stray very much out, out of his out of doors too much. He stayed in that house. Uh, he was a, a cancer uh, and uh, did his garden, played his croquet, collected his art, and. He liked imaginatively going to places that he wouldn't ordinarily go. He liked to, he there was a he liked the daring and the and the the sort of almost death defying escapades that Toback got. He couldn't believe it. He would regale uh, us with stories about all that. And I think to a certain extent, he entered those worlds to find out about emotions that he and, and situations that he didn't dare. Well, in that sense, that, that making films is a, is a sort of educational. It's a way of teaching yourself about yeah, well, about Pakistanis or about the Irish or about people who are different from yourself. And of course, eventually discovering that they're all exactly the same as yourself. Then came the French lieutenant's woman, perhaps one of the most famous of his films. And here's Barry Norman talking to Carol about that. Carol, um, the French lieutenant's woman is. I suppose it is what would be called an upmarket film. Um, are you surprised by the great popular success it's had? Yes. Very, very pleased, but well, surprised, yes. Yes, I, 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 I thought the film was a little bit too literary for the big audience, but uh, the love story seems to have worked for everybody, thank heavens. Well, in America, of course, it's been a huge success, Wonderful. hasn't it? Wonderful. Now, what good do you think that does to the... British film industry as a whole to have a, a big international success like that, which is indigenous, which is ours? Well, I think it does a lot of good. It, it, of course, this is not the only film. There are about five British films this year that are doing extremely well in America. I mean, Time Bandits and uh, uh, Elephant Man and uh, uh, Chariots of Fire. Just simply that the taste for things British seems to be returning abroad. You know, the British things have been rather out of fashion for a few years. After the peak of the 60s, uh, I think we've had rather a difficult time finding audiences abroad. And they seem to be coming back. So that must be good for all of us. That famous remark, the British are coming, that was 1982. Uh, Did that prediction come true, would you say, Stephen? No, the British are always about to come. (laughs) They're always about to arrive. I remember trying to get together, in fact, the year of the Queen, and there were several British films, and saying we should organise these as a group. And there should be an impresario who can sell them as a group of films. People looked at me as if I was mad. You know, it just, the truth is, success in America is, uh, particularly in America, it's always a fluke, I'm ashamed to say. Um, I don't mean for James Bond films or Harry Potter films, but it's for the sort of films that the rest of us make, it's really an accident. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, that Four Weddings was an accident. That doesn't mean it wasn't good, but its success is is uh, fortuitous, and my, be- my beautiful Andrea was certainly like that. The Queen was like that. Did the career fizzle out? I, I think that um, when he started making films in Hollywood, I think it must have been a very, very difficult time. I mean, The French Lieutenants was a sort of was one of the good bits. I think the word fizzle out is very unfair. I mm. mean, uh, Who'll Stop the Rain, uh, the Robert Stone uh, uh, adaptation of Dog Soldiers, was an e- excellent movie with Nick Nolte, and so was uh, Sweet Dreams. Uh, was a good commercial movie. It didn't fizzle. It just wasn't huge in the way that other famous film directors. Uh, he didn't have the output, as it were. But his work, when he turned to the theater... 
the work he did on Pinter and Beckett, which is all he worked on, was outstanding. I mean, so that he didn't lose any of the his his power of uh, or his perception. I mean, he was he he worked extremely well right up to the end. He just didn't want to go into the big arena. I remember when Carol had his stroke sitting next to me at lunch and he suddenly he tried to pick up a piece of meat with his fork and he missed the plate and he said what's happening to me and I suddenly realized that this was it and I remember thinking because afterwards I I, I want to study Carol because I want to watch how a man dies and he he died with great I mean over a period of time of, of, a, of a year or so he he was stoic, with great dignity, carried himself very well, and it was quite interesting because he was such a powerful figure, so com- quietly commanding, that when he it was when we were all at table as we always were joking around, he he wanted to listen, but but he couldn't take part in quite the the active way he had before, and it really upset Betsy, who wanted us to sort of as it were play soft pitch with him to let him be he didn't want that but it was it was a but for him to lose his power was a very poignant and complicated thing but he was he was right up to the end as far as i could see uh and i i saw a lot he was beautiful he was just a, 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 a you know he didn't waver he was strong in himself not Tell me, you two, you, you've, you've made a pretty good case for the man's talents and an absolutely passionate case for the man as a man and as a friend and, mm. as, um, and as a helper. If you hadn't known him, if he hadn't been the friend to you that he both was, would you have championed his great life simply as a film director? Well, Saturday Night and Sunday Morning is an absolutely fantastic film. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I can see what you're saying. Mm. Um, yes, I'm sure I would. I, I have a little little room where I keep my special things, and I have a little section of the room where there's a picture of Carol and Betsy at the table and stuff like that. And I think about Carol singing Hey Little Hen, <laughs> <laughs> or Carol used to say, when, he, when he, he, he didn't like something, he would say, Un appetitlich. <laughs> <laughs> And it just, it still makes me laugh. I still carry his voice around. In fact, it was quite poignant to hear it broadcast in the box. Do you think of him in that way? I get into a mess and I just think, oh, where's Carol? He'll, he'll know what I can do. He was, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is in my life, I sort of started again when I met him. And um, I learnt all sorts of things. I learnt really how to be a person from him. Uh, I think I would say absolutely the same thing. Mm. Mm. My thanks to Stephen Frears, who chose the great life of Carol Rice, and to our expert witness, John Lahr. Goodbye. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this Great Lives podcast. Many other BBC programmes are available as podcasts. You can find details at bbc.co.uk slash radio4.